Welcome to the best of real talk. In this episode, we're going to look back on some of our conversations about queer rights to members of the LGBTQ2S plus community that are fighting the fight on different fronts. The people whose faces represent very real stories that we know resonate with a lot of you. Do you need safety training that actually makes a difference on your job site? This episode of Real Talk is presented by Danatech. Danatech has been the leader in Canadian safety training for more than 30 years. Their online, blended, and instructor-led training courses combine regulatory compliance with real-world smarts and practical tips from experts who actually know how busy job sites work. Visit danatech.com to check out their course catalog and train your team the right way, starting today. This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. It's the type of situation that no elected official wants to find themselves in. A city council or town council meeting overtaken by, quite frankly, lunacy. That's exactly what happened in Leduc, Alberta. We talked to Mayor Bob Young right after. The thing is, we've come so far into think that being inclusive of everyone is a God-given right. Now, I'm going to show, I'm going to show you guys something here real quickly. The original pride flag, okay, had red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. What they added to it was this, a black, blue, baby, oh, sorry, I'm going to say this again, a black, brown, light blue, light pink, and white. I'm going to tell you the secret hidden agenda of this because there's lots. Do you guys know what that means? Yeah, good question. Someone please answer that since you no, guys all we're, promoted we're, we're it. We're not allowed to in public commentary to have a okay, back and forth discussion. You can okay, no problem. Let, let me explain. Let me explain to everyone who doesn't know, including you guys. You may not know. Okay. The black stands for necrophilia. Do you guys know what that is? That's sex with the dead. That's right, Ryan. The brown stands for bestiality. bestiality. Do you know what that is? Your That's worship. sex with animals. I call for a point of privilege. The blue uh, stands for pedophilia with baby boys. Okay, I've made the a pink motion. stands the for pedophilia with baby, with baby girls. The white response. stands for... So at this point, he cuts off her mic. So they cut off the mic, and, and then as the video goes on, you'll find that she starts to get applause. No, yeah, we're, we're, we're going too far. Now, Johnny, when I first watched this. Excuse me. Excuse me. And then he calls a recess. We'll take so a recess right now. That was Leduc's Mayor Bob Young that you hear say going too far. It was Leduc Councilor Ryan Pollard that you you heard there calling for a point of order at several times. That's that's basically you know following the rules of how meetings go. He's, yeah. he's basically that's like an objection. He's yeah. saying, he's, "Hang on a second, hang on a second. You know that. So at first, I wanted to believe that the clapping was people clapping that the mic was cut. Me too. Yeah. But I'm not so sure that that's the case. Now, Councilor Pollard posted right after this happened. And, and I'm going to read a portion of it. Public commentary is a feature of our meetings at Leduc City Council meant to give citizens an opportunity to bring concerns to their elected representatives in a public forum. It's something I believe strongly in. He goes on and says this first speaker, this is on Monday, quickly deviated wildly from the topic that originally he indicated. There was a gentleman by the name of Bill McDavid identified himself as one of the Freedom Convoy. And, and then this gal Laurel was with them. Uh, said uh, he, he's the less about the content, the better. But we were treated in part to a brief lesson on chemtrails, ultimately a disgusting profanity laced tirade in relation to the city's pride initiatives. Uh, I should also note that the RCMP and Leduc right now are investigating vandalism of a pride crosswalk. We're grateful that the mayor of Leduc, um, his worship, Bob Young, has agreed to join us this morning on the show. Mayor, thanks for making time for us. I know this isn't the type of stuff that you want Leduc <laughs> recognized for because there's a lot of great stuff happening in Leduc. But how are you wrapping your mind around Monday night? Uh, you know, Ryan, it's extremely sad that uh, we had to come to that uh, that point. Um, you know, <clears throat> I understand that, that people don't support pride. I get that. But 
for some reason, uh, they, they think that uh, we're uh, infringing on their rights by having a, a, a pride flag flying, by <clears throat> doing a uh, crosswalk, by wrapping a bus that says a seat for everyone. Uh, it's sad to me that we have people that uh, just hate, uh, you know, everyone. Mayor, you, you, you ended up shutting that meeting down. You've been in politics for quite some time. Has that ever happened before? You ever seen anything like this before? You know, Ryan, I, I've been uh, in municipal politics now for over 18 years. I have never, ever experienced anything like that. It's, uh, it, it was ex- a very sad day in the history of uh, Leduc Council meetings. So what do you think is, I mean, it, 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 we're talking to civic leaders, we're talking to community leaders in, in, in many different communities. We're seeing this happen. I mean, I'm going to play video after I talk to you from the, the Los Angeles school board president. They're seeing protests outside their schools down in California. The story's not limited to Alberta, but, but there seems to be an uptick in this type of protest. Are, are you seeing the same thing? And if so, what do you think is driving that? You know, Ryan, I have no idea. Like, I, like I, I think, you know, coming out of COVID that uh, there's a lot of anger that uh, was uh, created during COVID. And, and I think that's, we're seeing that now. I think politics in the States, I think, uh, you know, what we've seen in the States, uh, you know, there's so much uh, hate talk. Um, you know, it's now on social media, it's okay to go and just trash people. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's a sad time in our, in our society. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, that, you know, by airing things like this and showing things like this, that maybe we'll start to get the people, the silent majority that actually don't support uh, hate speech like this, that uh, they will speak up and, and start to take a stand. So, Mayor, when you when you shut down that meeting, uh, my understanding is that you left uh, council chambers along with at least one other counselor. What, what yeah. was that experience like? What did you hear uh, once you left and the door closed behind you? But I, I, I suspect that it didn't I, I, wrap up quietly. I give her no, absolutely not. It, so what happened is um, I, I called for a recess. I left, um, you know, because, again, I didn't want to say anything or do anything that uh, would just uh, inflame the situation. So uh, I called the recess. That stopped the recording. Um, I left the, uh, the chambers for probably about five minutes. Um, you know, I, I could not believe uh, all the yelling and screaming uh, that was going on. I give our city manager uh, great credit. Um, what he did is um, he uh, helped uh, try and get some of the people out of the uh, out of the chamber. Um, what happened is I came back into the council chambers and uh, I asked council to make a motion to go into closed session. Um, we passed it immediately. As soon as we went into closed session, uh, that meant that everybody had to leave the chambers. And again, I give uh, our city manager a lot of credit. Um, he basically helped people um, get out of the chambers. Um, it probably took about 10, 15 minutes. And, uh, you know, and again, lots of yelling um, uh, threats. Like, I've, I, I've never seen that at a council meeting. Yeah, so I, mean, I wanted they, to ask you about that, Mayor. My understanding is that members of the council, perhaps including you, have faced threats. Are we talking written threats, verbal threats? Can you tell us about these? These are verbal threats. You know, it's it's sad, like, you know, when I first got on council, I loved public commentary because it gave people a chance to come in uh, and meet and talk to us about things that, you know, we weren't necessarily aware of. Um, what's happened, though, is over the last year, because we probably have the least amount of rules for public commentary of any council in Alberta. And uh, so basically, we don't restrict anything. And what's happened is our, our public commentary has evolved into um, just this ugly duration of council and staff our city manager actually removes our staff uh from the chamber uh <coughs> to protect them it, you know it, it's uh it's it's unfortunate I, like i said you know i would love to and uh, you know my door is always open I, I will talk with anybody but uh when uh you know people start coming in and berating council uh, and and staff uh you know it's gone too far so is this going to change the way that that you politic i mean is, is this going to change the way that that, that things work in leduc uh, i hope not you know like i uh, like i i truly believe that uh you know that we're we're going to move past this and uh you know and again i i think um Events like this on your show where we're making this kind of um, public displays uh, uh, known to everybody, I think that you, that we will see, uh, you know, the like I, I truly do believe that the majority of people 
are disgusted when they see things like this. And, you know, uh, I really appreciate seeing the Oilers and Connor McDavid the other night where he, he says the Edmonton Oilers are still, uh, it's a game for everybody. And, you know, the city of the Duke, um, on our buses, it's a seed for everyone. And, uh, you know, I hope that that's a message that comes out of this. Uh, Mayor, when you see stuff like that go down, uh, well, when you witness it at the council meeting Monday night, when, you, when you're when you obviously aware that RCMP are investigating vandalism of that pride crosswalk, what does that do to your resolve uh, to observe pride in the city of Leduc? You know what? Like, th- it just proves to me that we have to do more. You know, like, it's uh, for the life of me, I don't understand how people are so threatened by having a rainbow flag or a rainbow crosswalk or a bus uh, that has been wrapped with a, a great message. Like it's, uh, I don't know why that threatens people. Like it's, you know, when my grandkids take a look at the pride flag, they they say, oh, look at the, all the pretty colors. Like, you know, it's, we're not promoting anything. All we're promoting is that everybody should be treated without discrimination and, and we should be in an inclusive society. I'll never forget what life was like before we worked with California Closets. And I'll, of course, always enjoy life after my wife Carrie and I had organization problems everything was stacked on top of everything else and man oh man it was tough to relax in our family space but California closets after our free consultation came up with a solution that was just perfect and they're working in garages too do you have extension cords on top of spare tires have you lost your hockey skates or you just can't find anything you need when you need it why not make your garage work for you they can get you started today at californiaclosets.ca we're seeing more and more stories of fires and floods in the news and of course every one of those stories has tough implications canadians are going to be trying to get their lives back and for a lot of canadians that means a restoration project at home or at work don't trust a big project like that to just anybody. Complete Care Restoration has a team of experienced and certified professionals working in fire and flood damage, mold and asbestos removal, plus other construction and renovation projects. We've worked with them and they've earned two thumbs up. You can find them online at completecarerestoration.ca. Do you want to be part of Canada's green movement? Do you want to be part of the move toward net zero? Kubi Renewable Energy is Western Canada's busiest solar installer. And right now, they're hiring. They're looking for those with tickets and they're looking for apprentices too. Kubi Energy is young, they're growing, and they're reshaping the energy portfolio in Canada. You can check out some badass projects that they've been working on and apply to work there by visiting kubienergy.ca. Hey, dog and cat lovers living in Calgary, Edmonton, or central Alberta, I want you to know about a special for the month of August from our friends at Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food. All the way through to August 31st, take 14 bucks off turkey raw pet food, the 40-pound boxes, using the discount code AUGUST2023 at checkout. And make sure you check out their supplements as well. We've got our lab, Monroe, taking the lion's mane mushroom extra extract it's great for dogs dogs that are dealing with obesity dogs that are senior dogs or dogs that are like our precious monroe experiencing anxiety you can learn more by checking out the blog link at granddog.ca randy boisno is on a very short list as an openly gay elected politician in alberta he served as the prime minister's special advisor on lgbtq 2s plus rights and he joined us in studio to talk about the green shirt guy the straight pride guy photographed with the premier and pierre poliev at the calgary stampede how do you feel about that? They're saying they don't agree with your shirt and they're caving into media's pressure. Wow, to be honest with you, like, Danielle Smith, I had very, very, very high hopes for her. Like, you know, she had passed the Alberta Sovereignty Act, which is, you know, put the Alberta First Act, which I'm very proud of. I come from B.C., but Alberta is now my home, right? And, you know, 
I'm I'm pretty sad that she caved within 24 hours of taking a picture with me and she could deny this picture all that she wants she read my shirt there was not an entourage of people there there was me my girlfriend and like two other people standing there when she took the picture with me so you know I'm a little disappointed in her as for Pierre I had high hopes for this guy I thought he was truly great I thought he was gonna bring Canada back again I thought he was our Donald Trump of Canada but it turns out you know what he's just another leftist wearing a right side suit so as far as Pierre goes man he lost my vote Danielle she lost my vote too so you know it's time for reform it's time to change our governments and it's time for the people to stand up and unite all races all colors all genders we all come from earth we're all the same people so there he is, the leader of the official opposition, wants to be Canada's next prime minister. That's Pierre Polyev posing with this guy. And, of course, Alberta's premier as well, Danielle Smith, posing with this guy. The shirt says, uh, basically, thank a straight person for your existence. Uh, straight pride uh, on the back. I think the, the quote is Martin Luther King Jr. quote, actually. It wasn't it something like, you know, you got to break bad laws or something like that. I know I should know it, but um, I, I didn't spend too much time losing sleep over this shirt but but i also have a lot of privilege and i'm straight so probably you know, like for me i kind of i'll be honest when i see a shirt like this I, I can i okay i don't say this usually to federal ministers but a friend of mine says she says what's your take on the shirt i said it's small dick energy that's that's what that shirt is it's just sad it's just pathetic i don't i don't necessarily but again i'm straight okay Damn. so i'm straight but she said, she says, do you think it's hateful? I said, I, I don't know if it's hateful. It just to me seems just a little pathetic. It's like, you know, the, the, we have the black entertainment awards. Where's the white entertainment awards? We have the pride parades. Where's the straight parade? Like all this, you know, this kind of stuff. Right. You know, it's you know, and and uh, so I look at that and I kind of I guess in a way I just kind of shake my head and write it off as a little bit pathetic. But it was politically problematic for the premier, politically problematic for Pierre Polyev, um, you have served as the Prime Minister's special advisor mm -hmm. on LGBTQ2S plus issues. You are an open and proud gay man. How do you take that shirt? So look, it, the the shirt is is more than an, if unfortunate. It's a it's a dumb shirt. The, the majority has the power, right? And the majority of the country is straight, and the majority of the country is still white. And so mm. this person is not only straight and white; they're rubbing it in the face of people who have just been trying to fight for basic oxygen. That's it. That's why it really is, you know, it's really somebody who's overcompensating. I don't know for what, but what's problematic for the premier and, and poly is they should know better. Like if all you're doing is playing to your base, then you really can't say to minority populations that I have your back at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can't suck and blow at the same time on this one. And quite frankly, it's a real problem because you've got Polyev with openly gay members of his caucus. How do they take this? Are they welcome in caucus? Do they get to speak their minds? Like we have, we have uh, two of the conservatives and we have uh, a couple of new Democrats and there's me and Seamus and Pascal and Rob all created the Canadian Pride Caucus with a bunch of senators. Well, how's our next meeting going to go? Hmm. Like, have they tweeted out anything about this? No. None of the, and they're not allowed to. So are they really able to stick up for the backs of, of LGBTQ2 Canadians? And in a normal year, at a normal time, people might just write off the shirt, but not when people are in New Brunswick not being able to express who they are at school without them calling you know, their parents. Like here in Alberta, it was former finance minister Taves who passed a law that if you join the Gay Straight Alliance, somebody's got to call your parents. Hmm. Well, what the hell's the point? Nobody calls your parents when you join the chess club or the basketball club or the social club or quite frankly, even the drama team. But mm -hmm. if you're going to join a gay straight alliance, somebody's got to call your parents. Well, then all the gay straight alliances just folded because there's no point in having them. So it's about making sure that we stick up for people's rights, all people's rights and political leaders. Like I have this saying, you can be my ally and you're a great ally, but I also know that you've made it to the champion leagues. What do I mean by that? You're my ally when you tell me you have my back when I'm in the room. But mm -hmm. I know you're my champion when you have my back when I'm not in the room. Mm -hmm. Neither of these leaders were our champions in those moments. Um, if people want to dig a little bit deeper into what Minister was just talking about in New Brunswick, we talked to Philippe Fournier from 338 Canada uh, 
not last week, we were off last week, but if you look back in our most recent episodes, he talks about Premier Higgs polling uh, in his home province and, and the impact that that's had on that. If you want to go back, you can find it on YouTube or, of course, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, both leaders, uh, Smith and Polyev, said, w- we didn't read the shirts. And um, I, and you're chuckling Where's for your people BS listening meter? on the podcast. Like, there should be an actual BS meter that goes off well, behind, your, I, behind your head. So, the, so, so I'm not, like, uh, let me say this. Like, so this is how I would answer that is number one, <laughs> bullshit. Uh, but, but number two, like it is, and I've seen it and you've seen it, you've experienced it, obviously, to be the premier or the mayor or the prime minister or the dep, you know, whatever, um, you know, to be in a senior political, but, you know, as a recognizable person at an event like the Calgary Stampede, you are pivot here, photo, pivot here, photo, pivot here. photo. That is true. That is true. So for a second, I could maybe say, well, well, maybe, maybe they didn't kind of see the fluorescent green shirt with like the huge maybe. But then in that circumstance, and I know it's not popular yeah. to pile on staffers, and yeah. I know that people don't typically enjoy when, when broadcasters start asking questions like this, but like, where was the political support? Where was the team? Um, and so that leads me to believe, I mean, I find it very hard to believe that a premier or, or a wannabe prime minister's uh, team of handlers didn't see the shirt. And to me, the uh, availability for the photograph was calculated, which then doesn't make sense that you walk it back like either let the photo happen and own it and maybe just don't comment on it i know that like can i also say this is why people listen to real talk because this is like i'm having this conversation with a person who is gay yeah so like this is a very real conversation to have because this is gonna land with you a whole lot different than it's gonna land with me i'm just looking at it from like political strategy and i'll get hate comments over it over talking about this you better believe it Look at the comments. Mm. Look at the com. We tweet about this show. Half the comments will be, "Why the hell are you talking about straight pride T-shirts? Mm. What right do you have to talk about that?" And the right. And look, I get three hundred and sixty-four days to celebrate all my straight friends. Mm. I get one day where I get to be myself. And for all those people from rural Alberta, for who are now looking at the premier and going, "Does she have my back?" The only place they can go is to a pride place, is to a pride event. And maybe August twenty-fifth is the only day that they can hold their partner's hand. Or actually, you know, have a kiss when somebody's not going to judge them. Mm. And what's the gay agenda? Get the lawn done. Mm. Unpack the dishwasher, right? Do that. Make sure that the list of chores from your from your partner gets done. That's what the gay agenda is. It's none of this bullshit that's on people's t-shirts. And if people want to stick up for us, then do so. But don't play games. And the day that I see LGBTQ issues no longer being political footballs is the day that I will know that our work has been accomplished. Mm. It's the it's it's the same thing. Like we're seeing this in other countries. They got past this. Like my people are not like we're not political footballs anymore. And you want to go to the streets of Edmonton right now and talk to the kids. Sixty percent of the kids on the street right now are queer kids because their straight parents have kicked them out. I've actually seen the numbers higher than that. Well, it can be as high as seventy percent. Yeah, talk to Margot I mean, Long, right? Margot Long at, at, at YESS Department Support Services. And so it's real. And like, look, what happens when a fourteen-year-old or fifteen-year-old kid gets kicked out? Where are they going? Like, they'll couch surf for a while, but then that'll get old. And then they're going to try to, then they'll live on the streets. That's dangerous. And then maybe they get trafficked. And I can tell you the suicide and death rates we see among young people is high and real. So is the t-shirt innocuous? Probably. But the long value chain of that kind of intolerance leads to very unfortunate circumstances. And Pierre Polyev and the premier should know better. Mm. Um, there, during the Alberta election, I'm not going to continue to bang this drum, but there is there is like a trend that you can't ignore. You know, there's uh, you know a, a candidate obviously that was elected as an MLA in Lacombe Pinoca that made some pretty horrific comments about trans kids in yeah. schools, and everybody knows about that. You know, bigger picture, like with regards to international news, Bud Light, the whole controversy around their partnership mm-hmm. with a with a, a trans woman a, a social media influencer but one of their thousands of partnerships one of their thousands of promotions has has uh, earned i think that company a, a loss pretty significant loss of market share and we were talking about kid rock and all the you know these celebrities you know, like shooting yeah. you know cases of bud light with air 15s and and i saw i think it was in edson just the other day uh, i know it was in edson that they had their you know a pride uh you know an art installation that that was vandalized we got an amazing email out of edson by the way on friday listen to our most recent trash talk someone from edson being like let me tell you what edson's all about it was very positive uh, but i know that news like that is a bit of a gut punch it seems like uh, from my position as a as as an observer, it seems like there was more pushback 
uh, more controversy around Pride Month this year than in previous years. When you would think it would be becoming less of a thing, it seems to be becoming more of a thing. Do you notice that? So the journey towards rights are never a straight line up. They're roller coasters. Okay, so you have times where it's good. You're going up. You're going up, and then you're going to hit a dip. Then you got to go up again. So I don't know. Are we in the are we in the 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 downside of the dip? I hope we're plateauing. I mean, we saw this in Leduc, right? They shut down a, a council meeting. Yeah. Over over a bloody crosswalk, like a, a queer crosswalk is enough to shut down a Leduc council meeting. Well, guess that what? was about a whole lot of that was wild. We talked to Leduc's mayor thirds, about that. That was like, like they think chemtrails, and I, I mean know, it was half the room wasn't from Leduc. Yeah. Like I zoomed in to the Westlock town council over the pride crosswalk and they went ahead unanimously and so ralph larger and his council did a good job there i think look i think some of this is still uh anxiety and nervousness coming out of the pandemic i think some uh folks who feel uh you know that the their world isn't unfolding the way they thought are getting angry and they're getting organized and they're finding each other on social media and and they're lashing out but i can tell you that the majority of canadians um is are, are with us and it's why you know as legislators we put uh, protections in place for trans kids and trans people across the country and it's also why we now have a hundred million dollar lgbtq action plan that's rolling out across the country but i'll say this uh, because i talk about this when i'm talking about bringing people to canada because that's my job right mm. like we had 22 million visitors in 2019 we're almost back there my job is to get 40 percent more revenue uh, in from tourism between now and 2030. That's the federal tourism growth strategy that I just rolled out. But here's a stat for you. We are 0.0044% of the world's population. And yet we have 10%, more than 10% of the world's prides. So we punch 20 times above our weight hmm. when it comes to being proud as a country. There are 1,100 prides in the world and Canada consistently has more than 125 of them. So that also tells you something about who we are as people, and that includes Edmonton. And we, it was interesting because when I started as special advisor, it was Pride Month, and it was very Toronto-centric. So I blew that up. It's Pride season because Winnipeg starts us off in May, mm. and Calgary gets us to September long weekend. But Jasper's in March, Whistler's in February. In, in, uh, February. So there's Prides happening in this country all year round. And so, look, we're all in this together, and... Um, as, lo as long as we just let each other live our lives, we're going to have a healthier, uh, more diverse country. And that's what it's all about. It doesn't matter if you're looking to show up at a birthday or an anniversary, some sort of other party, or heck, maybe it's just a regular day that could use a little touch of something special. No matter the occasion, enjoy layers of celebration with a DQ cake. A DQ cake from the Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton or Sherwood Park makes any occasion a happy occasion. You can visit them at Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, or along Baseline Road. Pick up a cake from one of their freezers or order one custom from the Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Everybody's talking about the cost of living these days, and we know one of the biggest expenditures for families is groceries. Friesen Brothers has their flyer, the Family Essentials flyer, ready for you to check out right now at Friesen.com. Friesen Brothers, family owned, understands what it's like. You want to put great food on the family dinner table, but you're watching your bottom line too. Check out Easy Family Meal Solutions right now. The Family Essentials flyers at Friesen.com. I'm expecting a candid and meaningful conversation over these next number of minutes. Angela Glacel is a member of the queer community as well as a member of Robertson Wesley United Church, an affirming and inclusive faith community in the downtown Edmonton area. Angela is also the organizer of the upcoming Community and Connection uh, LGBTQ2S Plus Advocacy Conference, and we're going to get into the details on that. That's coming up uh, in about a week from right now. Uh, Becca Marcellus is a community outreach worker for Out Loud St. Albert. I can't wait to learn more about that organization. Uh, when not running programming or planning events, uh, Becca spends her time building relationships with schools and community stakeholders to increase the number of safer spaces for Out Loud's youth. 
And Basil Abu Hamra is a settlement practitioner uh, specializing in LGBTQ plus complex cases at the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers. Uh, Basil arrived in Canada as a refugee from Syria in 2015, not that long ago, actually. Uh, and he's played a key role in establishing what's known as the Rainbow Refugee Program. It's the first of its kind in Alberta's capital city, uh, providing immigration and settlement supports uh, to LGBTQ plus newcomers and refugees in particular. Basil also serves as one of the co-leaders of the LGBTQ plus newcomer Edmonton group. Uh, to the three of you, a very warm welcome and, and happy pride. Uh, Angela, to you, uh, people say, and, and you, you oftentimes see it as, as a reminder, as a celebration, and as a challenge, pride was founded in or pride is protest. Mm -hmm. What does pride mean to you? Um, pride still means that we exist and we are still protesting so many things and i think it's really interesting because if you don't if you're not necessarily part of the queer community and your lived experience is different you just take for granted that you know everything is sort of fine and everything is sort of good so pride is just um really recognizing that we're still you know having all these complex issues and we're facing all of these um different things that are happening right now and not all of them very good mm. yeah uh, we'll follow up on that obviously mm -hmm. in a second uh, becca what does pride mean to you personally um yeah i think in a lot of ways we're sort of returning to our protest roots um just with some of the things going on like you said um certain discouraging messages um coming from some people uh but it's also a reminder for members of the queer community and especially our youth that they um have value exactly as they are and that they are loved and they're a manifestation of joy mm. Mm -hmm. Basil. For me, uh, I think it is uh, to be proud of how uh, far we have come. And also, it's a reminder of the ongoing struggles faced by uh, LGBTQ individual face around the world. Um, and also, it's a call for action um, uh, urging us uh, to advocate for more equality um, and uh, human rights. Can you tell us about, about the Rainbow Refugee Program? This is one I know that's going to resonate with, with, with a lot of people that maybe are unaware that uh, an initiative or a support like this exists. Okay, absolutely. But it's a long story. Is it okay? That's okay. That's what Real Talk's all about. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, um, uh, 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 me, I came to Canada uh, late 2015 as refugee from Syria. Uh, I wasn't out back home. I was feeling uh, uh, living in fear all, all my life, hiding who truly I am. Uh, when I came here, I decided to be out. I want to live authentically. I want to live um, my life. Um, but it took me a long time, actually, to come out because I was looking around and I didn't find uh, a space for us uh, LGBTQ refugees and the newcomers. Um, later on, um, uh, I was uh, introduced to other LGBTQ newcomers and uh, we all shared that this there is no specific space for us here in Edmonton. So. Uh, we decided to make that happen and uh, we uh, started the LGBTQ newcomer group Edmonton uh, in 2015 and it's a social support group we are family for each other we meet weekly we support each other um, but during the group time we realized that there is more issues need to be addressed and the group time which is two hours every week it's not uh, enough and we don't have capacity to do that so bright center and the edmonton midnight center for newcomers they came together and they started the rainbow refuge program uh, so in this program we support lgbtq refugees and the newcomers with immigration settlement uh, um, accessing mental health uh, support uh, how Housing, employment, and many and many other services. 2015, 2016, what a huge time for you it in is. your life. It you, is. you leave Syria, uh, which I, I have to imagine, uh, in a way, feels like your heart being ripped out of your chest. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk to people who have, who have moved their entire life to a new country, a new culture, a new language, etc., and you decide to come out, I mean, you're, what have the last eight years been like for you, personally? It is... Um a journey for me personally uh, uh, it's filled of lots of 
<laughs> emotions. Uh, I am proud of where I, I am right now, what I did, but also I grieve that moments in my life that have been ripped uh, uh, from me, that been taken away, and I wasn't able to be who I am and uh, to, to live my life authentically. Angela, it's, uh, sometimes I find myself on these roundtables watching somebody listen to somebody else, mm -hmm. and b you are just it seems captivated by what Bezel's bring to the table, what he's sharing with us right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's a, you know, to share personal stories is a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not always necessarily the easiest thing, um, and that you're putting it into the work that you're doing, I think is incredible. Mm -hmm. Like when you take that and you move it into something else, that's beautiful. Yeah. Can I, let me say this, and, and as someone who grew up in the church as well, and, mm -hmm. and you've got to be really careful when you start talking about the church, because there's a lot of different churches mm -hmm. that follow a lot of different doctrine, that have a lot of different approaches mm -hmm. to a lot of different things, mm -hmm. including pride, right? Mm -hmm. And so with, with no disrespect intended to anybody that listens to this interview, you might suggest that when we say we've got a panelist joining our pride roundtable from a church, they're going to go, mm -hmm. Which way is this going to go? Sure. Right? But your church, Robertson Wesley United Church, is actually hosting this conference coming up mm -hmm. in April. Did you grow up in the church? I did not, actually. Okay. So I didn't find it until about, um, like, my, my faith journey, my spiritual path, whatever you sort of want to call it, didn't really happen until about 2017 wow. when I walked into Robertson Wesley. So that has been my experience. Um, so I also have a lot of privilege in that because I didn't grow up in a church where you can get like harmful messages from a lot of different directions. Um, so my experience, like I said, is coming from a really privileged place because it's been very positive for uh, me. Can I, I'll let our audience know that, that mm -hmm. in circumstances like this, we've had a conversation ahead of time. We've all had coffee in the green room and talked. And so people are going to go, gosh, he's asking very personal questions <laughs> and just rat a tat tat one after the <laughs> other. Uh, I, I, I have, you know, you have given me the three of you, your, your permission for me to ask questions. And I have asked you that if a question goes too far for you to just push back. So let's just put that on the record. So our audience knows a lot of people would, would, would say someone, you know, someone that, that, that identifies as queer, uh, to join a church as an adult might be an unusual circumstance. And again, mm -hmm. I'll get, we'll get a bunch of people, uh, members of a church or, or, or faith practitioner, that'll say, what are you talking about? Our church is wonderful and supportive, but others will know exactly what I mean. Mm -hmm. Did you see yourself as a young person ultimately joining a church? I mean, when, when you, when you yeah. realized, you know, I mean, everything that went into it and some of the, the controversy and some of the, like you said, harmful messaging that we see, mm -hmm. did you see that coming as a development in your life? Oh, that I would end up being like the member of a church and yeah. fully participating and, in and one? No. Coordinating a big event at not the church at and hosting a big thing? Oh, no, not at all. Right? Um, so it's surprising in some ways, but I had some other like personal kind of things happening at the same time that I see where it kind of led me mm. to there. But I also know that I didn't end up somewhere else. Like I ended up at Robertson Wesley. Um, so I think there's something to say to that just for me as a person because. I found like community and belonging there, which would be, you know, that's not the case for everyone, right? And I mean, not all United Churches are considered like affirming ministries, which are, you know, affirming is just like, we're, we're welcoming and inclusive and we like celebrate who you are. Um, so, but many United Churches are, but I just happened to find Robertson Wesley because they really actively wanted to be affirming. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing the conference is because we just didn't want to say we're something. Mm. We wanted to actually be something and be in relationship. So what would you say, by the way, for, for people that are going to be watching this and, and want to check out as we're talking this conference, learn a little bit more about it. They can check out community and connection dot com. I don't know how you got that URL community and connection dot com. That's very good. You guys got to hang on to that one and like keep it for like 30 years. What would you say to somebody that says faith and pride cannot run parallel? They are they are incongruous. Well, I would say it's everyone's personal experience, just in the sense of like. If someone feels that that's not something that comes together for them, that's fair, right? Like, I respect that. Like, I totally get that some people won't want to come to the conference because it's in a church. Like, it's being hosted in the church. Like, I fully respect that and understand that that's not something that's going to work for everyone, right? And so, but faith 
you know, faith and spirituality matters to some people and it matters to some queer people. Right? 100%. So, yeah. What would you say to people of faith that would say pride is incongruous with faith? Uh, I would honestly question their faith. Like, I wonder about um, sort of what they follow and what they've turned certain things into. I mean, people will often say, you know, it's my faith, it's my Christianity, but I mean, it's it comes out as being super harmful. So I would just sort of question about why not accepting and loving people, which is really, you know, what Jesus did, right? So you're turning it into something else for whatever your your sort of idea of mm. something is. Mm. Yeah. Um, I Gosh, I feel like we could talk about the Rainbow Refugee Program for an hour. We could talk <laughs> about faith and pride for an hour. Um, why do we make sure that we introduce the ethos of, of Out Loud St. Albert into this as well. And, and I want to circle back. I want to give you a heads up so you have some time to think about it. I want to talk to you about the assertion some folks will roll out that they love the sinner but hate the sin. Someone told me, someone shared with me, someone very close to me shared that with me last week, how harmful and hurtful that was when somebody said that to him. I think they thought they were saying it out of love, but he felt like it was a big, huge slap of the face. You know what I'm talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about, I can tell. Talk to us about Out Loud St. Albert. This is a group that a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people when they talk about this group, their faces just like explode into smiles. What's this group all about? What's so special about it? That's always so wonderful to hear. Um, it's true. I'm yeah. Not- so we um, are actually almost 10 years old. Um, we've had staff for about two years. Out Loud was started in St. Albert by a dad um, whose kid had just recently come out and who didn't have anywhere to go for community. Uh, so he was like, okay, well, I'm a problem solver uh, and started the first group actually in the church um, in St. Albert. Um, and then they found some kids, you know, as you were talking about, weren't totally comfortable coming there. So they moved it to one of the schools. Uh, and now we have our own space. We see, you know, upwards of 60 kids um, at our group nights and, you know, new ones every single time. Um, and there's just so much joy, like the staff all joke about, you know, the serotonin that we get from these kids um, and how it was really the place that we needed when we were their age. Right. So it's yeah, there's just so much joy bursting out of those walls. Um, and yeah, I get to go and speak at schools. I get to talk to teachers, to parents who want to better support their kids. Um, yeah, it's just a really, really wonderful way to connect with the community and just try to build as many safe spaces as we can for these kids. It's I always, I always sort of, you know, feel this little jolt of energy when you, when people like you um, talk about involvement of parents, mm-hmm. like parents want resources, parents want to understand, parents want to support their kids. Um, you know, that this, this sort of like the youth element of a lot of conversations around pride or a lot of, and, and, and outside of pride month as well, or what makes uh, so much of this conversation divisive. Like you, like, drag story time like that that's one example of of how when people talk about the youth Mm -hmm. and then something gets torqued up a great degree i don't know if you know the three of you are paying attention to the maritime so it's happening in uh nova scotia right now but you know this policy 713 relating to um students non-binary students or transgender students that that would need to uh, seek parental permission um if they wanted to you know use you know identify under a different Mm -hmm. name or change their name on school documents and it's something that uh, embattled Premier Higgin out there is having a real issue with with his caucus. He had some ministers no show to meetings yesterday because they're not supporting the move that he and his education minister are making. And it just reintroduces, I think, or reiterates here the importance of these conversations. I mean, what mm-hmm. it's like for you, what's it like for you to see a family come in a family unit, however you might define that as a parent or a couple of parents or a caregiver? And a young person come in together and say, we want to better understand this together. We want to walk together through this journey. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm very lucky that I get to run the St. Albert chapter of PFLAG, um, which is a national organization for like parents and guardians. Uh, sometimes we'll get, you know, aunties, uncles, um, teachers. And it's just, yeah, for these grownups in these kids' lives to come and, you know, talk through their feelings, get support, um, just so they can be the best, most loving, supportive person for their kid that they can, because they also, like, the kids are seeing those same messages, right? They're seeing 
the posters you just put up. Like yeah. we, um, I actually know the performer that was on that poster. Oh, for like real? the kids, yeah. This one here, yeah. Where if, if people are watching on yeah. YouTube, they're seeing this one. Yeah, Coco's going to be at St. Albert Pride. Actually, they're a wonderful person, an amazing performer. Um, yeah, so the kids are seeing that, and it scares them. You know, let so, me give some background to what that yeah. is. So this is from Marlene, not her real name. We appreciate her emailing into the show. Um, by the way, to our audience, when we say it's not your real, whatever, some people request anonymity. We've still verified who the person is, just so you know. Um, but, but Marlene says, please keep me anonymous right now in our community of Spruce Grove. We've got a very disturbing flyer that's been found on cars at local churches and events. I wrestled, by the way, with, with the decision on whether or not to even show that flyer. What do you think? I, sometimes I feel like people need to see what we're talking about. And then sometimes I feel like we're just amplifying the, the, the harm. I don't know. Do you, have a, do you have a landing point on that? I think it really depends on your audience, right? Like if this was something directed at youth, I probably wouldn't. Mm. Um, but I think it is also, you know, especially for adults to see kind of the constant messaging yeah. that we are getting because it is, if you look at out loud social media, we try to keep on top of it, but we get the same stuff. Do yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is an engaged and empathetic audience. I'll tell you that much. Uh, so Marlene says this, this is now the talk of the city now on local chat groups says I'm absolutely disgusted at the level of hate and misinformation uh, regarding this local pride event at a library. Um, Marlene takes a shot at a, a local city councilor who says that, um, Councillor Gillett has been spreading misinformation, lies about the event at the library, you know, talking about drag, inherently demeaning to women and girls, presenting a character of women, advising them that natural female attributes are, per- I'm going to let you respond to this, don't worry, uh, permissible targets for exaggeration, ridicule, appropriation. You know, they'd prefer events that do not expose uh, young children to grown men dressed as clownish versions of women allowing them to read stories under the guise of normalizing gender fluidity. I mean, we've, we've heard enough here from Marlene, and I appreciate her email. I mean, what would you say to, to folks, not just in Spruce Grove, but I mean, we know that this isn't limited to, to Alberta or even mm-hmm. to Canada. What would you want people thinking about? Yeah, I, I always find the drag story time people so funny. I saw one video that someone had posted, and they were talking about, oh, the parents don't know what's going on in there. But you can clearly see in the video, like, through the window into the drag story time and it's parents sitting with their kids. Um, So like, it's very, very easy to see what's actually going on. But drag has been, you know, around for hundreds of years. I mean, you look at Shakespearean plays, like those were men in drag because women didn't act at the time. Like it has been going on forever. And now we have drag kings and non-binary performers. And it's just a way to play with gender and just like, I don't know if these people have been to a drag show, but they're very fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's anything more fun than a really good drag show, to be honest with you, but I mean, everything's, <laughs> everything's politicized, right? Everything's absolutely. And, and fear and anger sells and works, unfortunately, more than anything else. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know? And people are afraid right now. There's so much going on with, you know, cost of living and everything being politicized and just so many different issues that they need kind of something to focus their fear towards and the queer community has become a really easy target i mean it's a target that's been you know used throughout history basil you you shared with us that you know growing up in syria um you you were and i don't want to put words in your mouth but i think Mm -hmm. you you told us that you were you were fearful or you were you were concerned about about coming out about Mm -hmm. you know living your authentic life Mm -hmm. you might say can you give us some insight into, and, and it's certainly not limited to Syria. Is that, a, is that a Syrian culture thing? Is it more of a conservative culture? I mean, certainly that region uh, we know is. Uh, and can you talk about yeah. young people and the young, the experience of young people growing up there? And when you hear of supports, like what Becca's talking about, what they have meant, what that may have meant to you, had those been available? I wish that support was existing uh, back home. But just to, to get back to your question, Syria is a liberal country, by the way. There, uh, there is not much conservative like other Middle Eastern uh, countries. Many religions that live in, in unity. That was Syria before the war. Um, however, uh, the LGBTQ topic, being gay, it's not uh, something accepted by the church or the mosque or synagogue. They, they weren't accepting uh, us. So my life there was living a lie every day. I have to act uh, that I am uh, 
straight i have to um to be fearful from um and what uh, what if my family know what if my community know what if authorities in my country know that i am gay so i will be jailed so that fear every day we are living uh, in uh, back home as uh, lgbtq individuals in the church community um, and in schools as well, I mean, there's uh, so much talk about, uh, you know, gay straight alliances and supports for young people. And do you find like in, in, in the congregation or in the greater community, is, is, is there an openness and even almost a desire or young people communicating, um, you know, the specifics of what supports they'd like to see or contribute to or participate in? Um. Offhand, I can't really say. I think that's part of what being in a firm in ministry is, is like going out and building those relationships because it's our job to build the relationships. It's not the queer community's job to do the relationship building, mm-hmm. right? And so through that, that's when we can kind of find out what these young people are needing, right? And what's important to them. And so... Um, and it could be happening in individual like individual churches like depending on their community within the church that could be happening like they could be having the you know families that have children who are queer right and then finding out that way so i mean we have like a fairly high number of people from the queer community in our congregation but not that many who are younger right has it always been with you know, with regards to what you know about Robertson Wesley United Church, um, I'll, I'll let people know that no, you know, locally. I mean, obviously, we'll have audience members across the country, but for those in the Metro Edmonton region, this is just off 124th Street. It's actually a stunningly mm-hmm. beautiful facility. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful church. There's a farmers market right outside it on the weekends, and right on a pedestrian stroll with a bunch of restaurants. It's I would imagine it's a it's a faith community, the brick and mortar element of it that can draw. Uh, people in has this been an intentional outreach like did, did, did the members of this church at some point make an intentional decision to be what did you call it not an inclusive community but what was the word affirming affirming community and, and if so how long ago was that and, and and how has that played out sure i mean it's they became affirming i believe in 2009 so it's okay. hard for me to speak to that part just you weren't because there i yet. wasn't there right, right? um so but considering some churches are still going through the process of affirming, they have been affirming for a while in that kind of way of looking at it. Um, but I can speak for me, like the reason why I was like also drawn to it is because I saw that they had the flag out. Mm. We have like pride, for, like outdoor furniture that's painted outside our church, right? There are like, there are signs to say that, you know what, like you can come here if you want to, like we see you and you can come here. Isn't it amazing that yeah. like a, a, a six inch rainbow flag sticker on a sign mm-hmm. or a flag on a flagpole outside of a, a facility or a business or what have you mm-hmm. um, can go so far mm-hmm. in in sending a message. It's like, uh, I mean, it's, and, and not, not just through June, you know, not just through Pride Month, mm-hmm. but uh, generally speaking. And you yeah. see more and more of it. I don't know if it's also serving as right now almost like. You know, when people talk about planting flags as a metaphor right now, it's it's almost like people saying that they're going to take a stand against, quite mm-hmm. frankly, some of the bullshit that they're seeing around them. Mm-hmm. Well, being an affirming ministry is one way for, you know, is the way for, you know, faith communities to be really vocal. Because you can say that you're welcoming and inclusive, but what does that actually mean? You're, mm. We're welcoming and we, we include everyone except, mm. right? So going through the process, because it isn't a process to be an affirming ministry, it's making like a bold statement to say that we are and we're doing our work to be in relationship with you and we celebrate you and you get to be a full member. And when I say full member, like there's a lot of churches out there that would not let a queer person run a youth group or a children's group, right? But in an affirming ministry, you get to be a full member of the life of the the life of the church. When you talk about the complex issues, maybe we can go around the horn here. Can, can, can we talk about when we say the complex issues that the queer community is facing? You right away, Becca, started nodding your head. What, what, what would be one of them? Let's, let's put these in front of people. Let's give our audience something to think about as they're listening to this podcast while they're walking their dog. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I can speak for, you know, all career serving organizations that we're all having capacity issues right now just because of the high needs. Um, I know for us with uh, our youth, a lot of them who weren't in safe homes, uh, you know, who their safe place was school or their extracurriculars when COVID hit, they lost that. And a lot of them had to go back into the closet for their own safety, right? Um, And that did a huge number on their mental health. And they're still kind of recovering from that. Some kids haven't gone back to their extracurriculars. They don't have those outlets. Um, They're still kind of trying to rebuild their mental wellness and get back to a place where they do feel safe coming out of the closet. And so, you know, on our group nights, we, the staff, it's about a 20 to one ratio of youth to staff. Like it's, we have capacity issues, I know, yeah, everybody else says there's just such high demand right now. And anytime I talk to anybody that's involved in social services, um, and in particular supporting young people, I'm blown away in a heartbreaking way at the statistics. Mm. And when you talk about the population of young people that are living on the street or, or utilizing shelter services or what have you, disproportionately members of the LGBTQ2S plus community. I mean, mm-hmm. I've heard numbers as high as 70%. Yeah, yeah, and that's where, I mean, Edmonton is lucky to have the CHU Project, who are some really amazing folks who, you know, do exactly that. They help out the queer, unhoused youth um, who, yeah, had to leave home or who were kicked out um, and just try to get them, you know, the things they need because for a lot of these kids, it's just, it's about safety, right? It's a lot of them, you know, would like to come out, but... They might not be able to just because they can't, you know, live on their own or they don't have another grown up that they can go to. Sure. Uh, Basil, with what you've learned, uh, did you come straight to Edmonton from Syria? Straight so you've been here for about eight years? Yeah. Coming up on 10 years. Yeah. Um, how, how would you describe Edmonton in, in the context of a, like a, you know, a safe haven or a, a destination for refugees or immigrants who might identify as, as part of as members of the LGBTQ community? Okay, so I think uh, having the Rainbow Refuge Program put Edmonton in the map as a safe ha- haven for uh, LGBTQ refugees and the newcomers. Uh, people are, uh, when they come to Canada, they come to Edmonton because they know that there is resources available for them. There is this community that have been built uh, for, uh, for, uh, for them here. Um, like through the experience i learned that edmonton is welcoming city there is great people in here in edmonton that's very supportive um um I know there is still gaps in services for lots of LGBTQ refugees and the newcomers, and uh, that's why it's important for us to to join uh, your conference, um, just to spread the word and do more advocacy uh, for their rights. Um, without obviously betraying anyone's uh, personal information, mm-hmm. not asking you to use names or identify yeah. anybody. But to give us an idea of, of the importance of this Rainbow Refugee Program mm-hmm. and the supports that it provides, yeah. could, you, could you tell us a story of someone without identifying them? Give us an sure. example of someone other than yourself yeah. that's moved to Canada under already, I would assume, a stressful circumstance. And, and give us an idea of how the program offers those supports and has, has assisted them in a big way. Sure. So... Um you know, like uh, refugee uh, claimants who are LGBTQ, they arrive here alone, um, uh, very isolated. They don't have uh, family support. They are alone. Uh, they don't have community support. Their ethnocultural community, they are not accepting them. Um, so they are very isolated. So they need a place where they have a sense of community. Um, so they arrive here uh, and they uh, access shelters um, here in Edmonton. Um, and then uh, when they come to our service, we support them with immigration, find safe housing, uh, connect them to mental health support, um, support them with employment um, and uh, uh, spiritual connection actually connecting them for churches that is affirming um, um, and lots of things so uh, you know like the, the, when we started the LGBT newcomer group it was only seven group members now we are over than 200 um, uh, member in our group um, uh, the 
the immigration part of our, the program, uh, refugee claimants, the acceptance rates before uh, the existing of this service, it was 60%. Now it's over than uh, 97%. That, uh, so that show you that if there is that support, if there is that acceptance here, um, that will uh, lead for a better life for everyone and one of them, the LGBT newcomers. For most of these people, is this their first real support system this is their first real support system and yeah. what sort of what, what do they tell you what do you see you know like personally like in the group environment let me tell you we are like a family uh so they they call me the queen mother <laughs> <So> <laughs> the queen bee <laughs> the queen bee uh, so uh you know uh they are they graving that connection to the lgbtq uh c community um, um uh, like they are experiencing their first bride celebration in Edmonton. Um, you know, that's so meaningful for them to see that there is people that they are there for them. They are supporting them and show them that they can be who they are here. Um, and uh, they can, like that's the most important thing that they need to thrive in our city and hopefully in this program we are supporting them to go there huh you know sometimes we'll, we'll be having a round table like this and everything's like really positive and encouraging and good news and then I'm like oh don't do it because yeah. I'm, a, I'm about to throw a real buzz kill under the table but but okay. this is real talk so Let's we gotta be real it. right okay. so this is an, this is an email from Simon Simon's one of the good guys um, says I'm a teacher at an elementary school in North Edmonton and uh, this week, we noticed that we had an abnormally large group of students absent. Uh, writing it off as another bout of illness that runs rampant through schools, I didn't think anything of it. But then I started to get emails and calls from parents asking what we were doing for Pride. And my response to these questions was that we talk about pride and that pride means being proud and feeling safe to be yourself and that everybody deserves respect and dignity for who they are. And everybody deserves the right to feel safe to be themselves at school and in society. And... Um, Parents asking about pride is not anything new, says Simon. I always get one or two every year. But this year, it seemed like the questions were endless. And I asked my colleagues if they were getting the same thing. And our office, it turns out, was getting inundated with calls and emails. Our principal reached out and other schools were also being bombarded. And our absence rate was 30% last week, says Simon. 120 kids not attending school. Wow. Through the grapevine, I learned that there was an email or a website that had been shared telling parents to keep their kids home. You're all nodding. So <laughs> obviously, we'll get into this. Um, says, I've not found this, but uh, some of the parents have, have um, I've asked them to share it with me if they feel comfortable. But they told me it sounded sort of like anti-LGBTQ conspiracy nonsense, you know, that the, the, the tr pride is pushing kids to be trans. And then I was shocked at how many of our parents participated. Like, we're a very inclusive school. We celebrate Diwali. Diwali. Uh, we had an entire month talking about Ramadan, Black History Month, residential schools, uh, you know, and now it feels like we're regressing. And Simon says, so I've done a bit of digging and it turns out that we're not the only school on the north side that's experiencing these issues. Some had uh, reported as high as a 50% absence rate last week. Um, Simon says, I'm angry. And at first I was angry at our parents, but then I realized that that was misplaced. Uh, I'm angry at whoever's sharing this hate-filled nonsense and scaring people with this BS. And every parent that reached out that had a conversation with me, I think felt better. And their kids were at school the next day. Um, as a staff, we decided that we're not changing a thing. We will continue to celebrate pride. We will honor our community members. Uh, Simon says I'm wearing the biggest, loudest rainbow shirt I can find to school next week. We're not pushing an agenda. We are honoring and respecting community members the same way we respect and honor other community members. Inclusion means everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That from Simon. Yeah, I, I have seen like a form email that was going around, just a copy paste that parents were sending to teachers about like, I hear you're going to talk about sex and gender and I don't want you to in this class and it'll be, you know, sent to grade two students or teachers. Um, and I think there's this really common thing among these sorts of people to really heavily sexualize the queer community, especially the trans community, um, which is just so wild to me, right? You know, you get a kid, you know, a young kid coming out as a lesbian and it's not them saying like, oh, I want to have sex with girls when I grow up. Um, you know, it's, oh, I want to be Prince Charming who rides in and saves Sleeping Beauty. Like, it's, we all, you know, I'm sure a lot of us had crushes when we were very young. Like, it wasn't about sex, right? And 
I think that's what they need to realize because it's just getting so out of hand. And they say, you know, oh, you're pushing young kids to be trans, but um, it's a lot easier to be cis. These kids aren't choosing it. <laughs> like, it'd be a lot easier for them if they weren't. Um, but this is who they are. And research has shown that kids have a really solid view of their gender by the time they're like four years old, right? You know, it's pretty common to see kids, you know, little boys wearing dresses or little girls, you know, like just kind of experimenting with what gender means to them. And then those kids, you know, some of them have really affirming parents that let them kind of, you know, experiment. And some kids are like, oh yeah, I am cis. Like I just, you know, played around and I decided I am what the doctor said I am. And others not so much. And then there's some kids who, you know, will make comments about feeling like they're in the wrong body when they're very young, but then we'll go back into the closet because they go to school and, you know, they hear, oh, boys can't wear nail polish or, you know, girls can't, you know, play baseball or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, I think they need to stop worrying about sex so much because it's just this very innocent, like, I want to be Prince Charming. Mm -hmm. Like, it's as simple as that. But there is, there is that, that is kind of like this recurring um, and I'm not saying it, hit, it it's a bullseye, okay? <laughs> but there is this kind of recurring criticism that you'll hear of Pride where someone that, that will be dismissing a Pride initiative will say, well, I don't know why we need to celebrate like who you want to sleep with. And it's kind of like, <laughs> well, that's not really, I mean, Angela, you're laughing, but like, it's like that's, that's not really what it's mm-hmm. about, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's the same when people are just like, well, you know, we it's I think it falls a line the same as like, well, we don't have a straight parade. Like you still hear that. Like that's a classic thing. Yeah. Like we don't have a straight parade. Or the White Entertainment Awards. The White Entertainment yeah. yeah. And that just comes from like you didn't have to, you know, fight for anything. Like it was all just sort of there for you, right? Um so those comments are I don't know. I laugh not because it's just like, but I just laugh because it's like we're still hearing them and we're hearing them so much. I know you're not laughing because you think it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We've got uh, Tara Lynn here on the live chat that says, shout out to Simon and that school. A hundred percent. Totally. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. 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 We we need to actually, Mm -hmm. it's a message for acceptance for everyone, not only for mm-hmm. the LGBT community. And it's also like celebrating brides in school. It's a message for that LGBTQ kid in the school that you are seen, you are supported, and mm-hmm. you can be your authentic self. Absolutely. And we are with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, a, a compliment here to the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers. I should read it. Basil, oh. you, just, you, you just got blown back in your chair and I haven't even read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy says uh, EMCN has some of the most skilled employment counselors because of their diversity and their inclusion workplace culture. Um, take us into this place. I've, I, I think, to be honest with you, and I've known the executive directors and I've interviewed people from that organization mm-hmm. for 15 years now, to mm-hmm. be honest with you. Um, but the word Mennonite in the title always kind of threw me. Like, I guess I, I had a sort of a, a misunderstanding of of maybe what it was all about. Yeah. Can, can you can you for people that aren't familiar with what this service provides? I mean, they, they provide integral services for people that are new to Canada. Yeah, we, we provide uh, services, all kind of services for newcomers to let them uh, thrive in our city. Now, back to the midnight comments, the midnight church, they were the founder of uh, AMCN uh, and that back to that when the Vietnamese refugees start to come mm. uh, to Canada um, now uh, and it started with two with one staff actually uh, operating from um, a basement in a church now uh, we are over than 200 staff from all around the world and Ryan guess how many Mennonites working with AMCN you tell me zero really yeah so uh, uh, th- we just have the name uh, because they are our funders. Um, Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fascinating stuff. But we are so thankful for the managers for funding uh, EMCN. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Um, can, can we talk, like in closing, um, Angela, right out of the gates, you made a comment about Pride sort of returning to protest. And I, I want to ask the three of you, and this is not in a way for us to get angry, um, that's for later in trash talk. You guys will be, you know, in the green room by then. But like to light a fire under this audience, or to 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 share some of the fire in your bellies. You know what I mean? Um, one thing as we wrap here, 
Uh, this could be a call to action. Uh, this, this could be like a proclamation, however you see it. One thing that you will focus your protest on this month. Um, just continuing to be loud and bring attention to things because complacency doesn't mean that you're inclusive and doesn't mean you actually support right or love or any of those things um so just being really loud and if it means like holding other people accountable to garbage then doing that as well Mm. basil how about you where will you focus your protest on advocating for more um uh more um human rights for lgbtq around the world now recently uganda introduced a new bill uh, it's a crucial uh, bill that um you know it's so sad that we are in 2023 and there is still s- like people produ- uh, um, introduce laws like this against the lgbtq community uh, so i think we have a long way in advocacy and uh, we need um you know our rights yeah you're talking in, in uganda for people that don't know yeah. um you know this according to a bbc report uganda's progress in tackling hiv and grave jeopardy um after that country's president approved tough new anti-gay legislation um the united nations the americans are warning over this an increasing number of people being discouraged in uganda from seeking vital health services for fear of attacks and punishment this after president yowari museveni signed the anti-homosexuality bill into law mm-hmm. Um, among the harshest anti-LGBTQ laws in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, People can learn more about that. I'm grateful that you brought that up. Uh, Becca, where is your protest focused this pride? I mean, it always comes back to our kids, really. I mean, we see young kids and teenagers having to go and pour their hearts out in, you know, seats of government, just screaming to be heard. They're marching in the streets when they should be, you know, in school and getting to be children. Um, And I think, you know, as queer adults, that's really where we come in and try to fight for them but it's also where our allies come in because we can only do so much right we need our allies to kind of take some of that emotional burden you know have the conversation with your shitty uncle at thanksgiving like you know if someone who's part of the career community is in trouble like please step in and help them we really need our allies at our backs to support us and help hold us up because we can only do so much what does it mean to be an ally? You gave the one example of speaking to your shitty uncle at Thanksgiving. <laughs> but like in everyday life, for a person who feels, um, and I know that the answer is like, pr- pride is important to everybody. Pride is, but for the mm. person that's like, it, it's, I'm fine with it, but it's like not my thing, or it doesn't impact me, or I don't know anybody that's gay. Like they do, but they, they just don't know it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, 100%. Um, I think, I mean, Angela mentioned allyship is very much a verb. It's not a checkbox that you use to make yourself feel good. It's not a badge of honor that you can, you know, take off when things get uncomfortable. It's having those conversations and sometimes putting, you know, your reputation on the line a little bit and standing up for people who are trying very hard to stand up for themselves but aren't listened to. Like there are some places um, our former executive director, uh, Terry, would go into because as members of the queer community we wouldn't necessarily be listened to or welcome and so he as you know a white straight cis man would have a lot more power than us right and so it's using those privileges that people have to help further um the safety of the community and that's really allyship for any marginalized group Hmm. Layton's an ally. Layton sent us an email um, out of Westlock, Alberta. Shout out oh, to Westlock. We're going to be there next week. Are you? Yeah. Yep. What are you doing in Westlock? <laughs> well, I'm guessing it's going to come up in this email. Yeah. Well, it says on June 18th, uh, a rainbow crosswalk will be painted on the street in support of the RF Staples High School's GSA, their mm-hmm. Gay Straight Alliance Thunder Alliance. Uh, Layton says it's been voted on and approved by the town council. Um, but due to scheduling, they can only close the road on a Sunday, which happens to be Father's Day. And uh, so there's somebody out there, um, Benita Peterson, says she's been local, you know, very vocal against this and is rallying her troops. Uh, this is a familiar name for people in the area. She's reached out, says Layton, to my underage daughter over Facebook to have her take down her petition in support of the endeavor. Um, and though her message is not threatening violence, she is reaching out to other kids in the GSA 
Layton says, so my wife and I have filed a restraining order. Mm -hmm. Um, And although the uh, mayor, Ralph Larizier, has told us there will be police attendance there on the 18th, the local cops have told us they will not attend unless there is an emergency. Layton says, I feel like this is crossing boundaries, people reaching out to children in bullying and harassing manners. Um, These posts are spreading hate. Um, And he says, and I'm willing to speak out against this. And Layton, we appreciate you doing so. Oh, yeah. This has been on your radar. Oh, yeah. We love the Laytons of the world. Um, Yeah, no, it is. We unfortunately aren't able to make it to the crosswalk painting, um, but we are going to go hang out with the GSA kids for a bit um, because, yeah, like adults and strangers are targeting them and sending them hate to, you know, children. And it's just so unbelievably inappropriate. Yeah. that yeah they can't even you know it's the whole like pick on someone your own size kind of yeah, thing right yeah. it's like if you have a problem like talk to an adult right well don't. i don't want to use I, I never want to use the word easy because life is not easy for for a young queer kid or at least for a lot of them right so i don't want to say it's easier uh to be in a gsa and let's point out as well there's straight kids that participate in gsas too it's, yeah. it's young people participate yeah. gathering in friendship and, and community um, you know, it's easier in an urban center. Well, who knows who's to say these are all individual cases. But let me put it this way. Shout out to the kids that participate in GSAs in perhaps more hostile territory mm-hmm. in communities that are a little bit smaller, a little bit more conservative, where the magnifying glass is a lot more intense, where pushback is obviously clearly right in their face all the time. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. No, those kids are... Um very brave and we just send all the love in the world to them and to the people who are going to go and you know counter protest and stand up for this you know symbol from the community that the queer community you know they've got their back calling all professional engineers or those soon to get their png anywhere in canada or even beyond the team at apex automation wants to talk to you they're hiring skilled engineers and technicians that are keen on joining the move toward automation that want to be part of industry 4.0 whether you're an electrical or instrumentation engineer computer science or process engineer mechanical engineer electrical electrician instrument technician you get the idea there's a place for you if you want to realize your true career potential at apexautomation.ca if you're a decision maker for a business big or small or maybe for a municipality you know the value the importance of keeping your eye on your bottom line local environmental services understands that too and their customers in Edmonton and Whitecourt and Regina and area understand that they're about so much more than just garbage. They believe that communities deserve better. Learn more about your full service environmental solutions partner, local, by visiting localenvironmental.ca. Thanks for checking out the best of Real Talk. If you liked what you saw or heard here, make sure to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to check out our merch or how you can become a Real Talk patron, check out our website, ryanjesperson.com, and catch fresh episodes of Real Talk weekdays at 8.30 Mountain Time. 